Greetings, my friends. I want to commend you on gathering for this important conference examining the interrelationship between freedom, religion, and security. I wish I could be there to participate in person, but I welcome this opportunity to share some thoughts. I think we can all agree that one of the most pressing security threats facing the world today is that posed by violent religious extremism. And I would like, therefore, to focus my remarks on how religious freedom can be a powerful antidote to this grave security challenge. I will begin my remarks by outlining the growing threat this extremism poses, both to religious freedom and to the safety and security of the world. I will then summarize what I consider to be the woefully inadequate or even failed responses of, to this extremism by nations and governmental elites across much of the world. And finally, I hope to show how religious freedom, while itself a casualty of violent religious extremism, is also an invaluable tool in the fight against such radicalism. Like everyone else in this room, I have watched with feelings of shock and revulsion, horror and outrage, the rise of violent religious extremism in the form of organizations like ISIS in Iraq and Syria. I have seen the same reports you have. Women and girls kidnapped and enslaved. Men and boys beheaded or crucified. Families driven from their homes facing starvation and death. And 2,000 year old communities of life and faith uprooted and threatened with extinction. And I have seen how no religious group has been free of its depredations in the areas it has conquered. Indeed, ISIS has unleashed waves of terror upon Yazidis and Christians, Shia and Sunni Muslims, as well as others who dare to oppose its views. And we know that ISIS-inspired terror has not stayed in the Middle East, but has come to the very heart of Europe. Furthermore, we know that ISIS is not alone in perpetrating this kind of violence, too often in the name of religion. In Burma, Rohingya Muslims continue to suffer assaults from extremists acting in Buddhism's name. In Nigeria, Boko Haram continues to attack both Christians and Muslims who dare to counter its radical interpretation of Islam. From mass murders at churches and mosques to mass kidnappings of children from schools, Boko Haram has cut a wide path of terror across vast swaths of that country. In Pakistan, which I visited on behalf of USURF, extremists have launched devastating attacks again and again. There is perhaps no more visible testament to the sheer magnitude of these depredations than the millions of people who have been forced to flee from their homes. In Iraq, nearly three million people are now internally displaced as a result of ISIS's offensive. Nearly 7 million of Syria's pre-Civil War population have suffered a similar fate, and over 3.9 million more are refugees in neighboring states. And we know, you know better than anyone, that Europe has been rocked to its core by the chaotic influx of desperate refugees seeking safety and a better life far away from their blood-drenched homelands. Clearly, the unchecked rise of such extremism has unleashed humanitarian crises of utterly horrifying proportions and political challenges and crises are following in their wake. And so the question that arises is obvious. How have nations reacted to violent religious extremism? In some countries, governments themselves embody this extremism. In other words, religious extremism is part of their governing ideology. Thus, in Saudi Arabia, for example, the kingdom bans churches and any public expression that contradicts its own interpretation of Sunni Islam, while meeting out barbaric punishments to transgressors, as we've seen with the brutal flogging and imprisonment of Raif Badawi. And for decades, Saudi Arabia has exported its extremist religious interpretations through literature sent across much of the world. And in Iran, religious minorities such as the Baha'is, Christians, and Sunni Muslims 
as well as dissident Shia, have been subjected to arrest, torture, incarceration, and even death. While Saudi Arabia and Iran embody religious extremism in other countries, governments enable, or at the very least, tolerate such extremism. For example, in Pakistan, the government enforces the country's blasphemy law vigorously, with nearly 40 Pakistanis on death row or serving life sentences for violating this ill-conceived and ill-defined law. And that is a statistic unmatched anywhere else in the world. These prisoners of conscience include people like Aisa Bibi, a Christian farmhand whose death sentence was upheld many, many times in Pakistani courts. The weight of this blasphemy law falls disproportionately on religious minority communities, such as Christians, Hindus, and Ahmadis, which in turn emboldens religious extremists to assault these minorities. And while the government enforces the blasphemy law zealously, it lacks any corresponding zeal in bringing to justice those responsible for such assaults. While some governments embody violent religious extremism and others enable or tolerate it, still other governments seek to manage such extremism by granting or withholding favors from sectarian religious groups based on whether or not they support the government's policies. For decades, Syria's ruling Assad family took this approach, treating Syrians as members of religious groups vying for its favor, rather than as individual citizens possessing equal rights under the law. When massive numbers of Syrians took to the streets in 2011, demanding their rights as citizens, the Assad regime fired on them while turning sectarian groups against one another. As we've seen, the civil war that has followed has opened the door to unimaginable horrors which ISIS and other violent extremists have perpetrated. Rather than embodying, enabling, tolerating, or managing religious extremism, still other governments respond by training their sites on entire religions, or at least a critical mass of their adherents. For example, both China and Russia apparently have decided that the way to fight the extremism of some Muslims is by repressing all or most Muslims. China has taken this approach with its Uyghur Muslim community, while Russia has done likewise with Muslims in the North Caucasus region. And unfortunately, our own Western societies have had their own difficulties dealing with religious extremism. And a key reason for that is clear. For decades, our foreign policy bureaucracies seem to have forgotten the following critical fact. For the vast majority of people around the world, religion matters. According to a recent Pew poll, fully 84% of the world's population identifies with a specific religious group. And for many of these people, religion is not just one of several affiliations. It is a major affiliation. From worship to prayer, births to funerals, weddings to holy days, almsgiving to thanksgiving, religion remains a powerful source of identity, meaning, and purpose for billions of our fellow human beings. Yet, for generations, this simple fact somehow managed to elude, confound, or otherwise astonish foreign policy experts across the West. Time and again, these experts acted like the proverbial deer in the headlights when confronting some of the major events of our time, many of which were clearly driven by religion. Recall the shock and disbelief which followed the fall of the Shah of Iran in 1978 and his replacement by the radical regime of Khomeini, despite numerous indicators that Khomeini's movement was on the rise. Recall the astonishment of foreign policy elites a decade later during the stunningly swift succession of events leading to the Soviet Union's demise. They just couldn't believe that Pope John Paul II's standing up to Soviet tyranny would propel religion-based freedom movements across the Soviet empire, 
helping to destroy its dictatorial reign. And, of course, the brutal reality behind 9-11 confounded the experts as 19 hijackers killed 3,000 Americans and themselves for no other reason than a belief that somehow they were pleasing God. The verdict is clear. Time and again throughout most of our lifetime, Western elites have simply missed the boat on religion. All too often, they have denied, downplayed, or sometimes even demonized the role of any and all religions as influences on people's lives. And in so doing, they have frankly failed to understand what should be obvious to all. You cannot conduct foreign policy with the rest of the world if you are clueless or dismissive about religion's role in the world. You cannot have a successful strategy against your foes if you are clueless or dismissive of their religious motives. And as a result, Western elites too, along with leaders and governments from other parts of the world, have failed to develop a coherent or consistent strategy against violent religious extremism. So how then do we counter violent religious extremism? We do it through ideas and beliefs which are neither violent nor extremist. How do we combat expressions of faith that dishonor some people? We affirm those that honor all people. But there is only one way for this to happen. We must stand unabashedly for the universal, fundamental human right of religious freedom. We must stand tall for the principle that all people have the right to think as they please, believe or not believe as their conscience leads, and live out their beliefs openly, peacefully, and without fear or intimidation. We must stand firmly for the notion that the way to defeat bad religious ideas isn't with no religious ideas, but with competing ideas, both religious and non-religious, operating in a free and vibrant marketplace of ideas. Study after study shows how it is the absence of this marketplace, the absence of religious freedom, which correlates with violent religious extremism and other ills. And it is the presence of religious freedom, which correlates with more stability, more security, and more harmony. In December 2012, the Institute for Economics and Peace, an Australia-based organization, released a ranking of countries based on the number of terrorist attacks between 2002 and 2011. Six of the top-ranking nations in terms of terrorism, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, Nigeria, and Russia, are among the nations that the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom has flagged as serious religious freedom violators. Why is there a correlation between the lack of religious freedom and the presence of violent religious extremism? Based on what I've already said, there are at least three possible answers to this question. First, as we've seen, when governments enforce laws, such as blasphemy codes, that stifle religious freedom, they embolden extremists to commit violence against perceived transgressors. We have clearly witnessed this pattern in Pakistan. Second, when governments repress religious freedom or fail to protect it, they drive some into the arms of radical religious groups and movements. In the case of both China and Russia, repression of Muslims in the name of fighting the extremist views of some has produced violent extremism in others. And finally, governments that crack down on religious freedom across the board in the name of fighting extremists also unwittingly strengthen the extremists by weakening their moderate but perhaps less resilient competition. For example, under President Mubarak's decades-long rule, Egypt ended up strengthening the Salafists while weakening their more liberal opposition. Granted, to embed religious freedom in this society is no easy task. It is hard work indeed. It is work that in many places will take years and perhaps decades. It is work that will require replacing the rule of man with the rule of law. 
But to those who say it can't be done or shouldn't even be tried, my question to them is this. What is the alternative? Do we trust in strong men who will keep radicalism in check? Tell that to the Christian and Yazidis who trusted that Saddam Hussein or Bashar Assad would always be there or in full command. Do we just bury our heads in the sand and hope that extremism doesn't come to our own countries? Tell that to the relatives of the 9-11 attacks in America or the victims of the Charlie Hebdo or Hypercaché attacks in Paris or the recent bloody attacks in Brussels. Make no mistake, unless it is countered by religious freedom, the virus of religious extremism will continue to cross oceans and continents. When Christians in Egypt or Ahmadis in Pakistan are jailed for blasphemy or attacked by extremists for supposedly violating such laws and we are silent, we should not be surprised when attacks commence elsewhere in the world, including in the streets of Paris or New York or as we recently saw with the murder of an Ahmadi man in Great Britain. When Coptic Christians are beheaded by ISIS in North Africa, people risk succumbing to the same fate elsewhere. Clearly, the world's business is our business. And that is why we are here today. That is why I am here speaking to you. Standing for religious freedom is not just a moral imperative, but a practical necessity for any country seeking to protect its security and that of its citizens. That includes America and all of Europe's nations. Simply stated, religious freedom deserves a permanent seat at the table of our country's foreign policies. And the good news is that we are now seeing an unprecedented effort to build global coalitions to advance this liberty. The European Union has issued strong guidelines for its diplomats on promoting freedom of religion or belief. In the UK, the Foreign Ministry and Parliament have sharpened their focus with people like Baroness Berridge working tirelessly on the issue. And the Austrians, Dutch, Italians, Norwegians, and Germans also have focused specifically on religious freedom over the past several years. In November of 2014, USERF, the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, working together with parliamentarians from Brazil, Canada, Norway, Turkey, and the UK, helped launch the Interparliamentary Platform for Freedom of Religion or Belief at the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, Norway. More than 30 members of parliament signed the Charter for Freedom of Religion or Belief, pledging to advance religious freedom for all. And this initiative has continued to grow by leaps and bounds with close to 200 parliamentary members around the world. So, to sum up, as violations of religious freedom are a global problem, we are, thankfully, seeing the unmistakable outlines of a global response. But as we work toward a more global response to the global challenges facing religious freedom, we must never lose sight of the fact that when freedom of religion conscience or belief are attacked, real people suffer. And we must always keep these brave souls uppermost in our hearts and our minds. I'd like to close my remarks today with a story that I think beautifully illustrates the profound connection between religious freedom and all the other precious human rights that we so cherish. John Wycliffe, the English philosopher, theologian, reformer, and preacher, undertook to translate the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into the common vernacular in the late 1300s. And he did so in the face of enormous opposition and even persecution from the ecclesiastical authorities of his day. Despite all, he persisted in this mission. And when his work was done, he wrote the following words in the flyleaf of that first Bible. The translation is complete and shall make possible government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Now we cannot know precisely what he meant when he wrote those words, but I believe he was illuminating for all of us 
the profound insight that when men and women are free to pursue and understand truth for themselves, they become empowered to build societies that honor the claims of conscience and the fundamental liberties and rights of all people. Thank you very much.